still doesn't quite get this, but um, you know, just because you see, this is a hundred thousand note. I think I think it's worth like twenty bucks, something like that. Um, what's one? Yeah, I think this is I think this is worth about twenty U.S. dollars, eighteen or twenty. I think I might be off. I think it's something like that. Um, but one common misconception is just because it has a lot of zeros, you see that uh, U.S. dollar. Um, you know, people people think that uh, that you know your dollar can go a lot farther there. That's a, that's a common misconception. Is that if, if a note has a lot of zeros, that means your U.S. dollar goes a lot farther there. That's, that's not the case. Um, a clear example of that, I think, is the yen. So Japanese yen. It's thousand. That's not a thousand U.S. dollars. I think it, again, I forgot what it's equal to by now. Um, it's been a while since I've since I've you know been in Japan, but uh, but actually, if you go to Japan with dollars, you'll quickly find that you know your dollars aren't going to just buy you massive amounts of stuff. So you might be getting back hundreds of thousands of of yen. But then you know, going into the grocery store to buy something brings top thousands of them. Uh, so we're, we're going to get into that. That's not actually going to be the topic of today. Today we're going to talk about uh, money. We're, we're, we'll get into those kind of international exchanges at the very end, the very end of this class. But um, this class, actually, what we're going to cover is uh, we're going to cover money and banking and looking at the roles that they play in the economy. You know, when you all first came in, you asked about, you know, GDP, everyone thinks about that dollar terms. Hopefully by now you understand that we talked about real production, but now we're talking about money and banking. So, um, first of all, I'd like you to kind of think about, just like conceptualize, what would, what would the world be like without money? Yeah, you'd have to trade, right? Um, I'm not sure. Have you guys have you ever thought about the challenges you might face? Okay. Yeah, you, you always have to negotiate stuff, right? Be bartering, trading. Um, so think about the challenges though, like, so you'd have, you'd have to barter and negotiate. That would be a challenge. That'd be a, that'd be a hassle, right? Cause it's like, okay, I want to go get some food. I have a microphone. How many cheeseburgers is a microphone worth, right? Um, one of the functions, one of the fundamental functions of money is that it gets, it, it puts everything in terms of a unit of exchange. So it facilitates, it, it gets rid of that challenge. It puts, it makes dollar, it makes uh, the dollars, you know, currency makes uh, microphones and computers automatically, uh, you know, you, you can see exactly the, uh, you know, the amount of dollars it takes to get a microphone, the amount of dollars it takes to get a computer, and that's a lot easier to sort of work out than how many I want to switch between uh, some different kinds of goods. There's also another challenge, though, which... Um, you can imagine, like, you go back in the day during this bartering world. So you had, like, uh, say you, were, you had cows, right? And you want to go get chicken. Or something like this. First off, you'd have to go find the person who's selling the chickens, which is something like we all do here. You want to find something, you got to go find the right place to buy it, right? But you'd have a second challenge. Not only you have to find the person selling the stuff that you want, but you have to find somebody that wants what you have to offer. This becomes a lot harder, right? Um, they call these like the search, it's kind of like a search friction. And remember, we had uh, search frictions. Where, where was that? That came up before. Y'all remember? Employment. The type of unemployment comes from search frictions is frictional unemployment, right? 
There's all kinds of frictions in the economy. All frictions are in search matching kind of problem. Money smooths, smooths that problem out. Um, so in order for something, so first off, what I want us to think about is like, what, what is going to be, what are the characteristics that define money? Okay, we've already listed a couple here. These are textbook things, kind of like questions, but first you gotta have, it's a unit of exchange, right? Needs to be accepted, commonly accepted for types of goods and services. Those are some big problems already. You can see like the big improvement already, just imagining this. There's also other things that are really cool about money. And, that, and that's this, is that, uh, well, first off, how did I get this dollar? How do you think? I worked for it, right? I worked for it, which, which, which means I put, I created some, hopefully, I, you know, I, I created some kind of a value in, with labor. And I put all that value into something I can put in my pocket. You see? If I didn't have money, I had no way to store the value of what I created, then I'd only be stuck consuming the things that, so if I wanted to go work for food, I could work for food, they'd give me something, right? They might even just, I might work and the person has apples, they give me some apples, those things are gonna rot. I gotta eat it or barter it, but I can't just put it in my pocket and then next year or five years from now, pull it out and eat the fruits of my, my labor. So money has to be a store of value. It's a, it's, a, it's a huge function that money provides as a store of value. Um, and then it's a store of value. I want you to think about what would be some things that would degrade that store of value. What's that? Well, yeah, if you rip it. So, I mean, like money has to be durable, right? With paper, like you can wash it, you can do all kinds of stuff. It doesn't it's not like regular paper. It has to be durable. Durable in a physical way, but also durable in a value way. We think about value durability. We already talked about how does, how does money lose its value? We talked about this in the second lecture, in the second part. What is it? Inflation, right? Inflation is like a little mouse nibbling away at the value, right? Um, actually, I should have gone and got my textbook so I could show you some pictures out there. They had some, there's periods of time actually where you get what's called hyperinflation. This happened around the world in different places. In your book, they show you uh, Germany in the 1920s. And and actually, I wish I had the books so I could quote you the exact statistics, but I think it was from a base year, and I forgot when it was 1917. So that means the, the CPI or the, the base year being you have, a, you have a index of 100, right? I think it was like five years or something later. The index was actually in the, I, I want to say it's either the billions or millions. You just think about that so so what that meant is that the, you know they, they had so much money and it would be it was so there was so much inflation that it literally took people running around with wheelbarrows of money to get a loaf of bread people were using money to light their stoves to wallpaper their their walls money became actually only worth its actual intrinsic value. Its intrinsic value is that it's paper. Intrinsically, this is worth more than this. Take a piece of paper, right? If I ask you which would you rather have, <laughs> I mean, I think everyone knows, right? So its, so it's actual value is just in paper. Um, Money, money's actually taken a lot of forms though. This is this is paper currency. Anybody aware of other types of money we've had in history? Yeah. 
Yeah, precious metals are common, right? Gold, actually like you know, satchels that you might wear around with like some gold, silver, this kind of stuff, right? Also in some places they use things like shells, rare shells. Um, of course it has to be rare so we can go to the beach and become a gazillionaire. Um, but those have been used, there's all kinds of things that have been used. Um, are you aware, yeah, go ahead. Cigarettes could be, or in prison. Of course, I've never been, so I watch the documentaries, they're always trading things for cigarettes. Right. That's true. Yeah, cigarettes, you have all kinds of things that could be money. They're gonna have the same qualities. They're gonna store value, they'll become a unit of exchange, you know, accepted. Right. Things have to meet those criteria to become money. And once they lose any of those criteria on any of the dimensions, the value of it turns into its intrinsic value, in this case, paper. Or it becomes questionable, right? So I gotta ask you, who does Bitcoin here? Yeah. Wasn't someone gonna bring me a Bitcoin article? Yeah, I don't see them. I gotta start taking attendance again. My, like I said, I just got a new laptop. Y'all are coming in here, you should get credit for it. And my apologies, I just got a new laptop. And now it's been about 40 minutes ago or 50 minutes ago. <laughs> okay. So uh, we'll start that again on Tuesday so y'all get credit for, for um, Bitcoin though. Yeah. You guys are familiar with Bitcoin, right? Um, it's got some challenges. Can you imagine what any of those might be in terms of like what we talked about the functions of money? Based off of the value that people put in. So if somebody puts a million dollars, you know, it, it will increase in value, but if someone takes a million out, it decreases in value. Yeah, and actually if you plot, if you look at the Bitcoin price over time, you see that it's very volatile, right? So the vol volatility, I mean, it, it, it's climbed up super high and it's crashed down super high. It's crashed down, it's, it's, had, it's had big swings in value, which degrades what, uh, which are the characteristics of money? It degrades the store of value, right? In the sense of, if you pay me in Bitcoin, if you pay me in dollars, I mean, we have inflation. I know about how much money, how much stuff I can buy, the real value of this in terms of stuff. I can feel fairly confident that next week I can go buy about that same amount of stuff. Right? But if you have something that has a lot of fluctuations in it, then you give me this thing. I know how much stuff I can get today, but I don't know that this might only get me half the amount of stuff tomorrow. And that could be a problem. You only care about the real stuff you can get, right? So, so it's, not, it's got this volatility, which questions the store of value. Interestingly, the dollar, the dollar has been one of the world's most stable currencies historically, looking back at the last century, okay? I can't talk about where we're going, where, where we're going to go. But uh, it's been stable such that other countries actually are, are willing to hold this U hold U.S. dollars in their bank accounts, the governments I'm talking about. And when there's volatility, they just default. So, so a, a smaller country like Indonesia has a lot less mo money monetary base. You know, if people start trading, it, all these currencies also are traded on Forex, they're traded on exchanges. And so they're, they're open to uh, variations from speculators. In other words, speculators take different positions and they can actually drive the markets and push the markets around. 
that can make volatility. And of course, you don't want volatility. So you have central banks that, um, that hold massive amounts of US dollars. And say, say just for instance, the uh, Indonesian, I think it's the rupee, I think. I'm not sure exactly, I can't believe so. But the Indonesian currency, if it, if it starts to devalue and go down, well, their bank can take out of their vault US dollars and actually buy their roof, buy their currency and drive and keep their prices up. And if, the, and, if, and if it starts to appreciate too much, they can sell their currency and buy dollars. And we'll get into all that at the very end of the course, okay? International exchanges and things. But, but the US dollar has been incredibly stable and used widely to support other currencies stability. Um, do you know that, is anybody aware of the history of the dollar in terms of like, have you ever heard of a fiat currency? Anybody ever heard of fiat? There's a lot of, so there's a lot of technical terms in this chapter that you'll be expected to know. I, I would go through the definitions of things so you can make sure that you can answer stuff on exams and whatnot, but fiat currency just means it's not backed by anything except your faith in its value. So it's valuable because you say it's valuable because there's faith of the government saying this is valuable. Um, historically, anybody know the dollar was backed by gold? At one point, you all didn't know that? So I, I, I had one of these somewhere and I couldn't find it. I was digging through, I, I collect money of different varieties for the heck of it. But um, I, I actually had a silver, also gold and silver. So I had a silver certificate. And you go back, back in, back along back, or I guess it's the early part of the last uh, century. You take a dollar and you can walk in and actually get precious metals exchangeable for however many ounces of whatever, gold, silver, whatever. You can walk in and be like, I want my gold. Bam. In the US, you've heard of Fort Knox. You know, they, they store a bunch of gold in there that they, that they back their currency with. So you get a bunch of gold that backs the currency. And, uh, and that was like, that was going on, right? Well, what happened actually with Brent Woods is you had a bunch of countries out there that were becoming more and more willing to hold US dollars as this, as what we call a reserve currency, a reserve currency meaning in their foreign banks and doing this exchange to keep their currencies afloat, just basically holding, you, they're holding US dollars in their banks. And at some point, we kind of came to this place where it's like, okay, people want to hold US dollars in their banks, but we don't have enough gold to keep this keep this going, right? So we got a, we got a, we got a departure from the gold standard and moved into a fiat currency. Right? Which most most everybody has a fiat, a fiat currency. I don't even know where you can exchange things for metals anymore. Um, I don't even know if that exists uh, anymore. But now we have now now we have a bunch of fiat currency. Oh, I dropped some. These are actually some coupons from China. This was the communist system. So instead of money, they give people coupons. And remember the, 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 the thing that a market solves is how much is produced, who produces it, who gets it, all that kind of stuff. Well, in, in communist China, when Mao Zedong first took over and they were trying to implement communism, they give everybody a certain amount of coupons. Every one of these coupons is for a certain amount of wheat, a certain amount of rice, a certain amount of cloth. And you got an allocation based upon maybe your family size or something like that. That's just like, here you go. Now you can use, and you take these things to market and you can exchange them. So actually in a pure communist, in pure communism, you actually don't have private property in a, in a, in a pure communist ideal. Pure communism is actually a sort of a lack of private property and which is why we never really had, 
we've had communist parties as a political sort of a political party, but you know, communist China is actually not is not pure communism as it was dreamt of. You know what I mean? They're actually very much more market oriented. They got away from this. Now they have the the room and be. Um, so let's see here. I was going to say, you know what I might do? It's a little late in the day. Would you all mind if I just ran to my office real quick? I just want to grab the book and make sure I hit every point because I think by this time in the day, I'm going to forget something or get your homework. Give me just two seconds, okay? Give me two seconds. I'll be right back in two seconds. A little tiny bit of a crutch just to make sure I remember to cover everything. So, yeah, actually, there's some good graphs here too. I'm glad I did that. Um, let's see here. We talked about money, we talked about barter. And uh, one thing is about measurement. So this is kind of really important to know is how do we measure, how do we measure the money supply for the US? We actually have these two measurements uh, that are common. You have M1 and M2. I'll go over these in some detail. If you look at M1 and M2, so we start with M1, I want you to look at. This is a this is our metric for the money supply. And you have currency, the cash out there in the economy, right? And then you also have checking account deposits. Why should we think about checking account deposits as being part of the money supply? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so do you, how many people in here buy things exclusively with cash, with currency? Sometimes it's kind of easy to track, right? You get like a stack of money. It helps me to budget sometimes. I'm like, okay, I got this stack of cash. I can spend, and I watch it go down. Eventually, you're out. You know, if you're if you're living tight, which uh, sometimes we all are, you might overdraw your account or something like that. If you're I, so sometimes cash is really easier that way. But probably everybody has. I mean, I, I don't normally don't carry any money with me. I normally just bought a card, right? I mean, that's that, that's the more typical way for, for payments. You know, you've got your balance in there. You just swipe it. So this is sort of like the cash that I have that I have access to right here. Kind of makes sense to think about that as part of the money supply. There's something interesting in this graph. First off, when you look at M1 traveler's check, probably nobody you know, probably don't know what a traveler's check is. Huh? It's a little tiny sliver of M1. It's not significant. Huh? It's like a check that, that don't don't worry about that. The biggest part of M1 is really currency and, and, and these account deposits. And I want you to see the size of these two things. And what do you notice? Well, checking account deposits actually account for more than the currency. Well, that's kind of weird, isn't it? You put the money in the bank and yet there's more money in the bank than there is money. 
Is that weird? How do you think that happens? Did they have a clue? That's what I'd like us to think about. How, how do we end up with more money in the bank than we have than we actually have currency? What well, we're going to answer this? Hmm? Direct deposit. Well, still, it's direct deposit. You're going to basically direct deposit is transferring money from one account to another account. Right? But they had to have money in the first account in order to get it in the second account. So that means they had to put some cash in that first account in order to have access to it so they could make a direct deposit. Right? They couldn't take all the money out of the second account and put it in the first account. They could put the money in the more of the so here's the point is that you, you, you couldn't take all of the money out of the bank and turn it into cash. There's not enough money to do that. So, so, so the answer to this question rests in our banking system. We are, um, our banking system is what's called, uh, it's a fractional, it's a fractional reserve banking system. Anybody familiar? Well, let me give you a little history about how this all started. So back in the day, you can imagine, you know, people with satchels of gold, right? Gold pieces, gold satchels. And that was what they're using. And so they actually, uh, I think it was uh, the metal smiths or some of these people that were involved in this way actually became the holders the, the place where you could take your gold your excess gold you don't want to leave it in your tent you want to put it somewhere safe where you can get to it later and so they started dropping it off with these guys and i forget exactly who they were in the society i know they had something to do with metals i'm just forgetting who it was but these people would hold on to it for safekeeping and eventually they came to the realization that hey guess what People might show up, let's so they drop their money, they drop off their gold, and they show up almost like an ATM and take some out. Some people might move and they take all of it. So they got, you know, they got stacks of it back there, right? And they started to realize that, hey, there's a lot of gold back here. It's just sitting on our shelves. So here's a bright idea. How about I put some of that to work? And they start giving out loans. You come in, you want some gold. Okay, I'll you know, give you a loan, right? And so started the process of actually putting that money that's back, that's the money that's in the bank to work by lending it out. So, and they, and they realized actually that they could, that they could lend out, you know, if you come in and you, you bring in say $100, that you know, I might be able to loan out 80 of it and still be okay at the end of the day. Because, you know, well, I got enough back there, you know, that I can cover my I can cover any kind of withdrawals that come in. That kind of runs into some problems though. Can you imagine what those problems? You can probably imagine what those might be. What's going to break a system like that? Yeah. Massive withdrawals, right? So, so that fractional system works as long as everybody doesn't show up and ask for their cash. That's why I'm saying, like, we don't have enough cash to pay everybody out in cash. Okay? If that happens, I mean, what are you going to do? On the medieval days, you might get your head chopped off. <laughs> They're going to go medieval on them or something. I don't know. I don't really know enough about that history. Um, in the modern day, it would mean you show up at the bank and you're like, hey, I, I need some, I need, I'm gonna make a withdrawal and the bank's like, sorry, no, we were out of cash. What do you think you're gonna do? And you're gonna freak out. 
you know, I got my, I got my, all my savings in there and I want to come get some out. You're not going to give it to me. What the, I mean, you're going to freak out, right? And nowadays you probably get on your phone, you get on your Twitter or whatever, social media. I'm like, dude, I just went to the bank and, and I couldn't get my cash out. And what do you think your friends are going to say? What do you think they're going to do? Well, they're going to get panicked. You see? They get panicked. They go to the bank and they start asking for their money. And pretty soon you get what's called a, a run on the bank. That's called actually technical term. It's a run on the bank. It's this massive sort of, uh, what we're going to come back to the measurement. I'm going to jump around a little today. Um, but you end up with these things called bank runs. And what happens is you get some kind of bad news in the economy. You know, depositors all rush to the bank to get their cash. You can't, uh, they, they can't get the stuff, they run out, right? And then you get these people and they're sort of spreading, it's contagious, it's like socially contagious paranoia, socially contagious kind of fear. There's this contagion effect, everyone floods in. And in order to make, in order to get the money, the banks have to start to liquidate assets. You got to sell assets to, you know, so they're going to start liquidating their, their assets that they have. Which, when they liquidate assets, that causes asset prices to fall, causing more, causing the economy to have more problems, causing more bad news, causing this vicious cycle that just keeps going around and around and around, spiraling out of control. Happened in the US in the 1930s. It was, uh, this was threatening to be going on in recent months in Russia and Ukraine, both countries. Ukraine had, uh, you know, you got a war coming. Everyone wants to go get money so they can leave the country. They're all lining up and the banks have to say, okay, we're going to limit the amount of withdrawals you can have in a day to deal with this. Um, it was happening in Russia too. So in Russia, you had, uh, just to give a little, I'm not sure if you're following the news, but there was actually a lot of, uh, a lot of fear about things that were kind of spreading around through the Russian economy. Uh, do you know what we did? Do you know, anybody know about some of the sanctions that we put on Russia? So remember they have, so they have those accounts where they keep a bunch of US dollars and other things. Right, that they use to stabilize their currency. Well, we froze those accounts. We're like, hey, you guys can't have access to them anymore. We froze them because they were in Swiss. There was, I think, for the first time, like a Swiss bank account got involved politically. A lot of different bank, a lot of so, so they, they were keeping these monies in, in other countries, and through uh, through the different partnerships, we convinced them to freeze all the, these Russian accounts so they couldn't get access to their reserve currencies. And at the same time, they're having a lot of people sort of freaking out, going to the banks, right? So does anybody know how Russia responded to that? Well, they responded by printing more money and stuffing it in the ATM machine so people don't freak out so much. So that the money is there. So at least you feel like, okay, I got it out. And then they contagion it. Right. But when you print more money and you stuff it in the ATM machines so people can get it out, I mean, can you see that's that's inflationary, right? So you have inflationary pressures building in Russia, and at the same time, we hamstrung them so that they couldn't balance those inflationary pressures by buying and selling US dollars. Kind of, uh, this is the economics. This is a war, right? The economic war. And it's kind of interesting. It's, it's going on. It's going on currently, actually. You see all that stuff. So we didn't quite yet get to how banks are formally creating money. We just said that they that they do it by. Uh, 
lending out. And so what I'd like to do now is just show you, and this is this comes from, you'll do calculations on this, okay? So like in your homework, the thing, got some problems like this. But I wanna just like run you through, I wanna run you through uh, this kind of idea, which is that, so imagine like you come, so, so, so there's a thousand dollars that's put into the system, right? That money goes into a bank. A bank has to hold a certain fraction of it. They have to actually keep a certain fraction of that. That's called a required reserve ratio. So that, that's, that's a technical term you need to know, but the re required reserve ratio is the amount that uh, the sort of the, the fraction of the deposit the bank has to keep in its in its vaults. They can't run that, that fraction out. Um, I guess we should, I should define what a reserve is, right? So reserves in this case, what we're gonna think of is the, the vault. The reserve is just sort of, just think about it like the cash in the vault. Um, so, so you have reserves, the cash in the vault, you have required reserves, you're required to, by the by a ratio, you're required to keep a certain number of deposits as reserves. And then anything you keep in excess of that requirement is called excess reserves. Excess reserves. Okay. The required uh, reserve, this reserve ratio, I, I believe they have it at 10%. I believe it's still 10%. I haven't looked. To find out later, it's a little less meaningful these days. And I'll show you. We'll, we'll look at some data stuff a little later. But, but the idea is that it's, this reserve ratio um, that they're required to keep is about 10%. Now, if the bank keeps excess reserves, what's it not doing? It's not lending, right? Remember, the bank makes money by lending it out. So actually the, the money in the bank, the money that you keep in the bank is, is actually a liability for the bank. It's not their money. But it takes that money and it gives it out in loans and then it collects interest on that loan. It takes that money and puts it to work. And that's how it makes money. It makes money because it can, it, it, it pays you interest and then now it's like a super low interest rate, but you know, it gives you a, it, it, it pays you an interest rate for the deposits you have. So it has to pay that out to you to keep your money there. But then it's gonna charge other people's higher interest on the loans that they take. And the difference in that spread is where the bank makes their money. So banks actually have, banks should be like really incentivized to go out there and make loans. Because if they're not making loans, they're not making money. Um, and historically banks would lend out they, they would lend out as much money as they could. It would be all the way at their, so, so if you require a bank to keep 10%, they would keep just about, just about exactly that amount. And they'd put the rest to work so that they could be profitable, right? And so under that kind of a scheme, what you see is this, is you see you, you inject a thousand dollars into the system, it goes into say Bank of America, right? Bank of America has a 10% reserve requirement ratio. So that means they can loan out $900 to whoever comes in the door, they put that money to work. I want you to think about how that money flows. That 900 that goes out in a loan gets spent somewhere in the economy. And most people don't keep pillowcases of cash. Most people put it back in a bank. So, the 900 goes back into a, maybe maybe not the Bank of America, maybe another bank, but in the whole system, it doesn't really matter. It comes back to say this PNC bank. 900 comes in. Now PNC gets 900 in deposits and they're gonna to wanna to put the money to work. So they're required to keep 10%, which means uh, they're required to keep $90. And that means they're gonna lend out 810. It goes out into the economy, gets spent, 
it filters back in, you know, someone's spending is another person's income. It goes out, gets back into the banking system, maybe in a different bank. That process just keeps going and going and going like that. <clears throat> just kind of going almost indefinitely. Um, and so one of the textbook problems we sort of dealt with is uh, for, a certain in, for a certain increase in these checkable deposits, what's the total effect on the money supply? Um, to do that, like, so, so what you'd have to do is you'd have to actually add up a thousand, now remember, M1 is checkable, it's cash plus checkable deposits, right? So <clears throat> you'd have to add up, you'd have to add up all of these different entries infinitely out into the future. And you wonder like, well, what's that gonna add up to? That's a lot of addition. How do we ever do that? Well, you guys probably don't have, uh, you might not have calculus backgrounds. I'll just give you a formula here, okay? If you, if you do calculus in series, you can, you can do like a series of infinite sums. And there's some calculus that would show you that it actually comes out to being this one over the reserve ratio is what's going to be called the simple deposit multiplier. And so in this case, the reserve ratio is 10%, that's 0.1. And so our multiplier is a 10. Which means if you inject $1,000 into the system, it'll get multiplied 10 times and the total effect would be a $10,000 increase. So kind of a, this is actually like one of the, the biggest fundamental things you see here is that banks by the virtue of lending actually create the money supply to grow. That's the mechanism going on. There. And that's why we end up with in our M1, we end up with a bigger chunk being checkable deposits than cash. Sorry, are you, are you, uh, you what? I'm just trying to make sense of it. Make sense of it, okay. Make sense of it, how? Yeah, really okay, no, great, that's I'm great. I'm confused in the bigger picture. Bigger picture what? Because it, it seems like all you're doing is taking $1,000 and giving it to another bank to say, I give you $900, you owe me interest on that one. They may take that 900 or 800 and give it to another bank to say, you owe me interest. And then you just well, keep going to bank to bank. Well, well, it does. Imagine this. Okay, so you walk in with a hundred. Say this is a thousand dollars. Okay, we'll just walk through this example. You 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 give it to me. I'm the bank, right? Now here's a thousand dollars in money supply. Taking currency, right? I take that and I put a hundred of it in my vaults because I'm required to by law. Ten percent. That means I have 900 to put to work. Now you come up and you say, hey, I want a construction loan. I'm like, okay, here's 900 bucks. You take that 900 bucks and you go hire a contractor, right? And you take that and you, give, you make your payment. The contractor gets that money, puts it back into a bank. Okay. Now, that, now, that's another, now that's another round. So that 810, or sorry, that, um, that $900 then goes into a deposit. And then that bank says, okay, I've, I've got $900 here. I have to keep 10% 90 of it. And I can go give a, another business loan to somebody else, see? And then that gets spent and put in, back into a banking system. Okay. You see, it kind of iterates like that. I got you. you got me? Mm -hmm. And you see that thousand dollar initial increase multiplies up to ten thousand. Now, in order to get this ten thousand, what you would do is you just keep repeating this process infinitely, and then you would add up all these numbers. But how do you add up an infinite number of numbers? You need calculus to do that, and that's where you come up with this formula. This formula gives you the multiplier, which is ten. So then you just take the thousand times ten to get the. That's the idea right there. <clears throat> um, I will say this. 
I don't, I don't, uh, I don't anticipate anybody has like accounting backgrounds here. So I'm skipping key accounts. Uh, all in your book. If you, when you come to the key accounts, you can read them. If it helps you, great. If not, I'm not going to do key account questions on your homework or exam. But if it helps you, that's great. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not going to. I'm not going to have you go through accounting. So, main thing you should know, though, is that is that uh, deposits are on the liability side of the banking se sector. Those are not assets. Those are liabilities. Because it's not their cash. They got to pay it. Somebody walks in, they can, they got to pay it. The reserves that are in the vault are assets. Okay. On the balance sheet side, it's probably the only balance sheet kind of question. Okay, so we get back to our measurements here. Now, does that kind of start to answer the question why we end up with M1 having? The money supply, it's actually got a larger amount of checkable deposits than it does currency. And now you all understand how the process of lending creates the money supply to grow, right? And the banks traditionally are incentivized to not hold on to excess reserves. They're incentivized to put it to work so they can make money. Um, real quick, we could. Real quick, let's just look at some data real quick, okay? So I think I'm gonna go. Good old Fred, let's just go look at the money supply. Actually, you know what I wanna look at? I wanna look at the excess reserves. You're gonna see something a little shocking. This is excess reserves of depository institutions. Depository institutions, those are places you go deposit money. There's actually a lot of other banks that don't take deposits. You have investment banks that help, help like, you know, help with IPOs, help with mergers and acquisitions, all that kind of stuff. But we're talking about depository institutions here. Here's excess reserves from the 80s to current, almost. What do you see? This is pretty shocking, right? Y'all, y'all definitely need to like check out this pattern here. There's this pattern kind of gives you. A, can you see that back there? You can't see it. So there's the 2008 recession. And what do you notice prior to 2008? What were the ex excess reserves? Remember, excess reserves being the reserves in excess from their legal requirements, if you have a 10% reserve requirement, that means they have more than that. That's the excess, right? What do you notice? It actually looks like it's zero, right? It's not quite zero because these are in uh, these are in millions of dollars. So you have almost $2 billion for the whole US economy. That's almost equal to zero. Okay? Um, but it was really kind of bound at the lower part. That's because banks are chasing profit putting the money to work. And then what do you see after 2000? You see a, this big pile, a gigantic pile. Up. I mean, like, look at this thing. Excess reserves swell, you've got millions, billions, trillions. You've got 2.6, almost 2.7 trillion that they swell to in 15, start to taper off, and then they swell again in this last recession, all the way up to over 3 trillion. Y'all see that 2008 was a major shift in our economy. We, we looked at the labor markets and we saw that people had actually permanently fallen out of the, out of the workforce. Remember we saw that, that there's like 2008 actually like showed that there's like the structure of the US economy changed. And now you see this in banking actually, 2008 too, banking changed. Banks now are holding on to all this excess cash. Which means they're not lending it out. These, these banks are not putting it to work. This, this isn't true for every bank, obviously, but in the macro, on the macro level, 
you see that there's a, a ton of cash sitting in bank vault. I guess now's the time to become a, the right, a bank robber, right? Instead of going into the bank vault, so loaded with cash. Um, unfortunately, most of it's digital. Good luck. Um, but that's telling, right? That's telling you that there's actually the banks are not they're not they're not just putting all that at the economy in lending and actually it, it, it gives you um it gives me a picture that there's that this act this money in the vault is a potential source of inflation remember bank remember the money supply gets created with lending right so now you got this big stockpile of cash if you just if all the banks started just lending up this cash out, lending it out, lending it out, money, the money supply, the M1 would just, it would grow. It would, and, and, and look at how much you have here. You've got $3 trillion in excess reserves. Okay. So what I'm going to show you is that there's actually this like, this is like, this is like inflationary potential. See that? You know what I mean by when I say potential? I mean like you know potential energy is like when I when I energy when I when I pick the glass up, now it has potential energy because when I let it go, it's gonna transfer that down, boom, to the floor, right? It's almost like you fill up a water balloon with water and it's sitting there, and it's not moving, but it could, right? So we have this potential for inflation just sitting there in our banks. If they start lending it out, money supply grows, that could start to degrade the dollar value. That's a potential source of inflation. It's been there for a while. And it kind of shows in some way to me, I mean, it speaks to me of uh, the bank's fundamental role is to take, so one of the bank's fundamental roles is it takes the money from all of these different savers and it puts it in the hands of investors who make real investments in the economy keep the economy going right banks make that happen you want to go start something big you need to have you need to have money to make your big ideas happen right unless you have all the cash in your pocket which most people don't so banks fulfill this role Taking the money of hands from savers, putting it in the hands of investors. That role looks like it's been kind of worn down since 2008. There's a lot more uncertainty in the market. That's what I'd say. There's more uncertainty, probably. Um, there's inflation potential. Let's take a look at M1. M1 money supply. How about that? Look at this graph. This graph knocked me off my socks when I first started teaching. Y'all gotta get your eyes up here and look at this graph. This is the M1 money supply. What do you notice about it? Like there was something just crazy. It looks like something crazy might've happened in a month in 2020, May 2020. So the M1, the M1 is this very stable, stable, slow growth, slow moving variable, right? I've showed you a lot of different, a lot of different macro variables and most of them have all this kind of variability in it, right? Doesn't that strike you that the M1 is is it's almost like a line. That's kind of striking to me. M1 is so stable. Speaking to the sta stability of our dollar. Right? And then 2020 comes around. We're getting towards the later part of Q2 of 2020. And we see this cliff, this gigantic, like never before seen jump in M1. That concerned the heck out of me. 
my first thought. So I was like, I mean, you never see something like this. And I just about fell over my chair. And then I started reading the cliff notes and I, and I found that they, um, they actually did some, some, some portion of this is because there's a redefinition redefin of what M1 is in that line. There's some portion of that um, that's defined a little differently. Actually, let me just, show, I'll go back to that. Too, so we can complete that discussion. So part of what happened to make that cliff is that some portion of M2 got recategorized as M1. Now, what is M2? So, so, so let's go peel this onion back a little bit. M2, M2 it includes M1. So M1, it's going to include M1 plus savings account. Over in M1, you just have checking accounts. Now we're going to also include savings accounts in M2. It also include like money market, mutual fund shift. I don't know if you ever know what anything like that is. It's basically just like you can lock your deposit. It's like, it's like a deposit account, except you lock your money up for like a certain period of time. So you can't touch it without some high penalties. And then uh, and you get a higher rate of interest. That's there you go for that. Those are small portions. So the thing you really got to lock in on is that M1 is, so M1 checking and currency, M2 is M1 plus savings and a couple other smaller fries. And so part of that big cliff that you saw was actually a recharacterization of M2 into M1. And so M1 grew by this big shot. But so then if that, if that's what I read in the footnote. So then I go, okay, let's go look at M2 then, okay? So let's go, let's go look at M2 over time. Interestingly enough, you see a jump in M2 as well. So that little footnote can't explain all of that cliff. How much of how much did M2 grow? Bro, well, this is, I think, what is this? Is this, this is weekly. So here we have March of 16, April. May, we're at what is that 17 trillion from 15 to almost 18, so three trillion dollars. A three trillion dollar surge in the money supply. <laughs> no matter how you cut it, the money supply was jumping, and, and again, when I look at the history. Looking at the history of that whole series, M2 is also a very stable indicator. It's a very stable series. It's not a bunch of fluctuations. Remember, you don't want fluctuations in your mind. And now you got this big jump. It's never been seen in any of the in any of our past history, any of our past modern history. We have this big jump in one single month. And you wonder why I was calling inflation, inflation is coming, inflation is coming, inflation is coming. How can you not have inflation if you make a big jump like this, right? So let me explain, where does inflation come from? Well, inflation part of it is you have the money, the money can grow, money supply can grow, and you have the economy growing, right? If your money growth exceeds the growth in your economy, that's when you end up with having some inflation. And there's a nice little, uh, here's, a, um, here's an equation you need to know to capture some of this stuff. We're, jump, we're jumping around. But there's this um, quantity of money theory. So you're responsible for this equation, which you have, uh, let me break this down. This is MV is equal to PY. What is this equal to? Well, you have the money supply. The velocity is sort of this idea of, of how much turn the money is having in the economy, how often it's like switching hands, it's got some velocity, it's going from person to person, right? That has to be equal by accounting, it's an accounting identity to this is this is our real production. 
times the price of that. So this is like sort of think about like this market value. How does that make any sense? Well, think about this. I want you all to conceptualize this class as being a country. And in this country, there's a hundred dollars in money supply, right? So if, if there were $200, if there's a hundred dollars in money supply, M is equal a hundred. If there were $200, in market value goods transacted sold in this economy, that would mean that this thing changed hands twice, right? In order, it's just an accounting identity. So does that make sense? Like you, you know, in order for this, in order for there to be two hundred dollars in goods sold, and you only had a hundred dollars, that means you're, you're you, got, you got to flip that up. You got to, you got to switch hands a couple times like that, right? You kind of get the idea. Like you have a certain amount of money. This velocity is sort of like this idea of like you can almost think about like how many times is it changing hands. And it has to be equal to the amount of the amount of that was actually produced. Does that just does that make really clear sense or no? No. Okay. Um, so so let's think about it. Uh, <clears throat> if you had. Uh, Okay, so so think about it. maybe I'll try to cook an example of that, but um, let's see here. If you have so, so it, it, it's basically it, it's basically this. It's like if, if there's there's some cash, right? You're gonna go buy this stuff that was produced with that cash. This is the price times how much ever much the quantity, right? This is your real sort of production. That's the market value of that production. Okay. So if I'm gonna go buy, and it's not just like buying a single thing, you're talking about an economy, there's a lot of things being produced. And so, but in order to buy that amount of stuff, if I have like, if I had $1, only $1 in the economy, and I produced a million dollars, a million dollars of stuff was sold in that year, that means that dollar had to float around the economy a million times, you see? That single dollar. If I had a million dollars in the economy, that means everybody just made one transaction. Everyone, you can accomplish that with one, all the money flowing one time, you see? See that? So this is an accounting identity and um, seeing you see the velocity, it's the average number of times each dollar in the money supply is used to purchase goods and services. Does that, does that kind of make sense? You have the money, you have the money supply, the amount, of, the amount of times it's turning over, that has to be equal to the market value of stuff purchased. That's just a, it's an accounting type of identity. Now, interestingly enough, if you if you hold the, the real production, the real GDP constant, okay, and if you hold and if and if money money velocity, the amount of times it's changing hands is also constant. If you hold those two things constant, if, you, if that was constant, then an increase in the money supply would have an automatically proportional increase in the prices. So in other words, if I doubled my money supply, prices would have to go up by two. You see that? If you hold V and Y constant, then you have that sort of proportional trade-off. Now, the thing is, is that the, that the velocity of money is not constant 
and uh, neither is output, neither is the real production. But, it, but, but, but holding those things constant, it just, it just helps to give an idea about how you would expect this, this kind of equation to work and how money, money increases actually should sort of proportionally transfer if you hold these other things constant. That, that's still valid. But the idea is that velocity actually can change. How would the velocity change during the recession? How do you think velocity changes during the recession? I think people are, are, are going out and, and buying more stuff, watching hands more, probably going to drop, right? You got, especially like, you know, you're staying home, you're not going out as much, you're not, you're not buying as much stuff, it's not swapping hands as much. And so during a recession, you have this effect where, where, um, where we had an increase in, we had a, we saw an increase in M2 that was just not historically seen before, and yet prices didn't move, did they? For a while, like I mean, I was sitting here going, "Hey, we got we got inflation coming, right? You can see it on the wall. It's not happening. Why isn't it happening? Why did, why does it take so long? Well, part of the reason is is because you're in a recessionary period, a contractionary period, there's less velocity. So you get increased in M, a decrease in V, and that puts less price pressures off there. See? At the same time, Y is also falling. You're contracting. When you have a recession, you typically have this downward price pressure. We have downward price pressures going on just from the recession, but at the same time, we've like pumped up all this cash. And it's almost just like when, it, and at the same time, all a lot of that cash you saw was falling into excess reserves. So it's going into the banking system, staying in their vaults, not making it out in the lending. It's not circulating out there as much. It's not being inflationary. But you know that's got. But you know that someday. We're going to come out of this recession someday. The banks are going to start lending that money out again, and someday it's we got to have upward price pressure. Again. Well, I can, I can, you can. So going back when I first started here a couple of years ago, I was calling inflation. It's coming. Everybody gets so caught up though in the now of like politics and the now of things, so that. You know, everyone just thinks it's happening, whatever's happening now. But no, you, you see that there's all these different effects that, that, that we're drawing this out. But you can actually see from the graph that from that M2 jump that there was no way we were ever going to escape inflation, inflation out of that. How are you going to get away from inflation? Right? Are, we, are we done? Okay, so I will assign, I'll, I'll assign some homework out of this. Um, so that you would so you can get some, some examples of things to work on. We covered money and banking. <clears throat> what, we'll, what we'll talk about, you should see the role of the bank, all that kind of stuff. What we'll talk about eventually will be uh, monetary policy. Like what is the bank, what does the federal government actually do to control money supply? That's one of the, the policy vehicles, right? So, but this is kind of a big section, just understanding the role of money in the banks. So really critical stuff. And I will take it. I'll take attendance next time. Like again, I just got a new computer, so pardon me. Okay. I guess Tuesday.